the, the interesting thing about, about Pissarro is that he is possibly the first Jewish painter, because I believe that it was not, they were not in the, in the religion, uh, they, they were not allowed to, to, uh, to, to do sort of figures, I think. But anyway, the important thing about him is that his father was French Jewish and his mother was Portuguese Jewish, but he was born in, he was actually born in, in, uh, in Barbados. He was born in St. Thomas, in, in uh, St. Thomas's Island. His father was a, was a businessman. Uh, he had, I think it's some sort of hardware store, something like that. But there was a certain amount of scandal in his birth because the father came, came to St. Thomas from France to, to take, to, 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 to help his uncle, who was, who was this businessman in St. Thomas, and the uncle died and he married the uncle's widow. And I gather that you're not supposed to do this in, in the religion. And so this was, so when Camilla, so Pissarro was born <laughs> to a slightly, slightly different, all the Jewish people in, 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 in St. Thomas were not very happy with the Pissarros. Anyway, she had managed to have several children. Anyway, he, the father being French sent him back to France when he was about 15, to, well, no, he was younger than that, to go to be educated. And he came back to, to the island and was obviously meant to be a businessman. But whilst he was not at school, he'd become interested in drawing. And there was a very, very, in this particular boarding school, there, there was a very good art master and he got really very good at it. When he came back, he told his rather bewildered father that he wanted to be an artist. His father thought he was quite mad, but let him get on with it basically. But he then, Start, so he, so he did, did a bit of work with the business, got very depressed, and so eventually was allowed, there was a, a the, the, uh, the St. Thomas, I should have told you, was a Danish island at the time, it now belongs to America, it's the Virgin Islands, but you know, at that time it was Danish, and there was a Danish artist there, a man called, uh, um, a man called Fritz Melby, and he took on Pissarro as a sort of student, and so excited was Pissarro about this, he enjoyed it so much that he determined to become nothing but an artist. So he, so he did. And to, 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 so, so he, he, he and worked with this Fritz and the Fritz and he then went for a year to Venezuela where they sort of literally painted. So let's get the first mm. two and I'll show you what the work was like. Now, right on the left is one of this Fritz Melby's man. You see, it's very, very typical, very picturesque type thing. And this is this is actually the harbor of Venezuela, this one. And uh, this was this was painted in 1853. Incidentally, I should have told you that this is around about 1850s, 1852, 53 is when they went to Venezuela. And the one in the middle, now this is interesting, this is early Pizarro. This is a, 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 a Pizarro, it's a, a farmhouse near the sea in St. Thomas. And the one on the right, which I think is charming, is two women by the sea. And that these are about 1854. So you see, he was already very, very sort of proficient by the time he went to, to France. He went to France in 1855. And of course, what did he do? He, of course, when, when, he went, when he got to France, he immediately went and looked for some of the, for, for, for some, for some uh, 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 you know, a studio. And he managed to find, of course, the, 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 the Glare studio, uh, uh, where, if, strangely enough, everything we're talking about connects with everybody else because, well, who did he meet there but, but, um, uh, but, but Whistler? Um, at that particular point in France in the 1850s, he got there just about the end of that big exhibition, you know, the one we talked about last week, uh, the one the 1855, the one where Corbet had his own suit, his own exhibition beside the, 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 the uh, official one. And so Corbet was the person to look at if you were a young artist, he was the one that was going to be the most exciting. So there was Corbet there and he, there, through Corbet, got interested in Delacroix, but most importantly, he finally met Corot. And the, he, the, Corot became 
somebody that he really, really enjoyed. So let's see the next one, and I'll show you a coro. Now the top, they are beautiful. The top left, that is a coro. That's the Vila Frey, and that was painted around about, it's actually quite later, it's 1860. The one underneath, it, it's called uh, the Petit Chaville, and that's 1824. And on the left there, that was a, that was a kind of coro that that uh, Pissarro, uh, Pissarro was uh, Pissarro was looking at. At the top there, it's it's it's, it's Corot's later style, later style. Coro, you see uh, himself on the right, on the top right here. You've got the first Pissarro. You're going to see the first French Pissarro, and this is the man at at uh, 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 Chenevere. And it's 1864-65. And by now, he's been a sort of pupil. Coro was a kind man. And he, he met him and they liked each other. And he kind of went to work with him, to really, to just, just to sort of to, to understand what sort of work he was doing. He became a very important friend. OK, next one. Now, this, this particular one, with the first time, we can see Camilla's details. This one is is a uh, it, it's the it's the key it's the road of uh, uh, the Pontois Road, and he actually got himself moved himself into uh, what I should have mentioned at the time. By this time, he's he's managed his his mother's his 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 fa family. His mother particularly came back to Paris, and his actually she was she was really a scullery maid, and he had an affair with this lady, whom he finally married. But he didn't marry until later. He met that Lucian was born out of wedlock. But this is why he moved with his little family to Pontois. And this one on the left is a very is a lovely painting. It's the very earliest one we're going to see. This is roughly about 1868, and you can see the detail on the right. Now, the colour on the right is the right colour, because this is, as I say. Now, look at something important here. What is he painting? He's painting a peasant's house. Note the sort of the, the ceiling, the, 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 the room, if you know, the thatch, the thatch roof. And particularly, <coughs> notice the fact that there are people walking in the street. The street is very much about the, the way that people live. So you see in the background, you can see you can see it in the detail rather there. And this is something that's going to absolutely always uh, identify his work. Now I have to tell you that he was, he called him, it, the, the word was an anarchist, but it's not an anarchist as we would now know the word. I suppose the nearest thing it was, was a sort of socialist, but he was right from a young man. He was very, very strong reader. He read everything. And he became very, very com committed to the idea of, of fairness, particularly fairness for the poor. And he was, but his, his attitude to painting people who were less well off, he was never, you, you, you never see him in a sort of a superior position. It, the people, as I say, if you look again carefully at the picture on the left, you can see the woman standing in the in the in the deep, uh, in the in the in the, in the ground here, right inside there. The people are always part of the the landscape. They're very very much in, uh, integral to the to the landscape. Okay, next to it. This is because of his his uh, his politics. Now I'm going to show you now the group who are going to be really the Impressionist. Now, this particular series, uh, the, the top left is Boudin, Eugène Boudin. And he, of course, came from Normandy, as you know. He came to saint Andres. He was a successful painter. And it was through him that Monet started to be interested in the landscape, particularly the seascape. And underneath that, there's, there's the famous Monet. And it's the terrace, and it's 1867. Again, his family, his family were, were 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 merchants, and he was supposed to be involved with the family. Again, he didn't do it. And this particular picture of, of the terrace was was when he was extremely broke. 
he, 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 he met and married Camille, and Camille was pregnant at the time, but he had to go home to his family, and they lived in St. Andreas, and this particular picture on the left is him looking out of the window of the family sitting in, in the garden overlooking the, the sea. Now, the very top right, of course, you'll recognise, and that's the young Renoir. The, yeah, Renoir is the only one, really, who comes from a, a, a sort of a, a, a working family. His father was a, was a, a, a workman, and he himself, uh, Renoir, started out by being a, a painter of, of, of pottery, uh, a porcelain painter. And he himself, again, got to be, uh, a, 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 got interested in art, and again, had went to free lessons. Now, all of these lot met each other at, at a free academy, which was called the Academy Suisse. And this is where they all finally met and became very friendly. With them at the same time, met at the same time with Suzanne. So we've got, we've got Monet, Renoir, and at the bottom here is the Pissarro. Now, this particular Pissarro is called Jalas Hill. And this, this particular picture was accepted by the Salon. Uh, the, 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 uh, as was Monet at this time. So we're talking about 1867. The particular Pissarro the particular was very much admired by Zola. Zola wrote about it and said what an interesting and, and, and thoughtful landscape it was. But of course, if you look at it carefully, you'll realize it's been looking it's very much like Corro, but it is very interesting. And what I think is fascinating about it he has carefully indicated each of the fields, if you look at the hill, which belong to a particular peasant in the background. So it's a working landscape. There are people in the, in the street, in the road, and the road is open to us. We are, we are being in, it, we were allowed to enter it. And you can see the beginning of the village just on the left. But basically it is, as I say, a working, a working landscape. Okay, next one. It's a, beautiful one. It's a very the beautiful colors. one, that one. And you see the differences immediately. I want to identify. When Monet paints the landscape, he invariably paints it as the sort of place you go to on holiday. You know, it's usually people. It's wealthy. aspirational, it's idyllic. It, it is, it, it, but it's the sort of place you see. What it amounts to is it, it, it's the sort of the bourgeois going out for the weekend and what they sit, how they experience the landscape. It's something to be played with. It, it isn't a working landscape ever. If you can see it on that one, you'll see it more and more as we go along. Okay, next one. Now, this is very interesting, Pierre. Again, we'll go back to Corot. The total left here is the church uh, at, at near Beauvais. And this is 1866, and this is now in the Louvre, which you would have known. And what we're seeing here on the right are the, is the beginning, the really serious beginning of, of mature uh, Pissarro. And this particular one is the village screened by the trees. Now look at this carefully. This is something he's going to use again and again and again. You get the, 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 the path lead, leading through to us. And you then through the trees, you see the village, but you're always, always in the center. You see this tiny figure here of the woman here, just about here. You can see again, this is one of, 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 of Camilla's details. So that color is the right color. And it's terribly interesting because it's, it really is as you, you come through the trees, you suddenly see in the distance, the, 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 the village. Okay, it's a beautiful one, this one. And this was 1860, 18, 18, 16, 1869. Okay, next one. Now, what was happening at the, exactly the same time, Monet and Renoir were painting again people enjoying themselves. And this is the same. It's the, it's the, these are the famous pictures which we know so well. They were, they were working together side by side, and they went. It, it's, a, it's an area just outside Paris, and it's, uh, it's a place called La Grande Ware, 
and it's 1869, and it's a place where the, the Parisians went to have a, a, a lovely day out in the summer. And of course, it's a dancing place. And you see this fascinating picture of the pair of them. On the right, it's Renoir, and on the left, it's Monet. And these two are painted exactly together again in 1869. Now they had, they, one thing they, they were all decided with, they were terribly fed up with the way they were all being, they, mostly they, their work was not being accepted by the salon. And they were looking desperately for somebody or somebody to, to show their work. And so they began to get together. Again, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, Pissarro who, who instigated the idea that they should get together and have a particular exhibition. He got this idea basically because he was, he was, he, he was friendly with a baker and there was a baker's union. And he thought the idea, they had a sort of, he decided to have a sort of union of painters. He called themselves, the, 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 uh, I think it was the, the sort of the, the association of, of, of artists. Uh, this is what they firstly called them. The most important thing was to find somewhere where they could have it done. And they were very lucky. They got friendly with a very, very famous photographer called Nadar, and who was, who was actually uh, leaving his particular studio. And it was on the, uh, the Boulevard Capuchin, and they, he, they had the first Impressionist exhibition in 1864. And they all showed him, OK, next one. In 1864, uh, they, they showed in the exhibition and uh, uh, the, the very, very poor, uh, uh, you know, criticism. But uh, there was a, the, 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 what happened then uh, was the Franco-Prussian War. And then the Franco-Prussian War, I think Monet went because he, by now he was married to, to Camille and he had a child. And he didn't particularly want to go into the army because I should have pointed out, which I've forgotten, not in the case of Pizarro, but all the others had to do a sort of a year's army uh, service automatically. And Monet had already done that. So he, had he had stayed in France at the Franco-Prussian War, he'd have had to go into the army. And so he came to, to London. And this is Monet's famous, famous picture of, of the Thames at Westminster. And this was painted in 1871. Now, when he got to London, he met a, a, a rather wealthy young man who wanted to be, who has got interest in, in, in art and decided that he, he, would, he would be supportive of these, these new rather avant-garde painters. And he was called Duran Ruel. And through Duran Ruel, he met Pissarro. Pissarro and his family, he'd come to, Pat, to, 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 uh, to England because, of course, being Danish, he, he wasn't really involved in the, in, the, in the war. And he came because he had some family in South London. And what we're looking at is the avenue, uh, is, 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 um, is Fox Hill up in Norwood. And this particular picture was painted by, by Pissarro at this particular time. And again, you see, it's a very, at this particular point, it's a very, it's not quite a suburb, it's just outside of London at this time. And you see again, the man walking down the street and the, the ordinary houses, this kind of thing that he's, he's painting. And okay, next to, and now we see something which is interesting. We see a Monet, which I didn't know about this Monet. And this is Monet painting of Hyde Park of 1871. Interesting to look at how his question is, Look at the, 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 the houses right in the background and the people wandering about. Or on the right, we've got Pizarro, the Avenue, Sydenham, also of, night, of 1871. Pizarro did about half a dozen pictures. There's some very interesting ones. For example, this is where the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Crystal Palace had been, had been put. And, and there were paintings here uh, at this time of him, him painting the Crystal Palace. And he, 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 they both stayed about a year. And uh, the, when they could, they went back to France. Okay, next, by this time they're working together. Now we begin to see something which is really very interesting because we begin to see mature, completely mature Pissarro. 
Now, why have I chosen this picture? It's called Landscape near Pontoise. When he got back to France, it was awful. The house that he and his wife, and by now several children, had lived in, had been occupied by the Prussian soldiers. And they'd taken his, in the studio, they'd taken all his pictures around. And there was something like sort of thousands, a lot of pictures. And they used them for, 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 to, for mud. They put them on outside and they walked on them all. So he came back to literally nothing. There were no pictures or something, very few pictures left. And he was tremendously upset and he had to start all over again. And he, he, he went, he, Pontoise was about sort of uh, 15, 20 miles outside Paris. And it, he lived there very happily from 1872 until 1884 in rented accommodation with his family. And but it simply all of his work was destroyed. Now this particular one is the landscape near Pontoise. And I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because this actually describes his work more clearly than almost anything else. Now the one thing again I keep on and I really, really want to emphasize you will never see a picturesque picture by Tissaro. Tissaro, literally, he made, he's tremendously contemporary in this sense. He really, really understood the landscape. In a it wasn't just some, something that the townspeople went to look at. The earth was looked after by people, and the people, the peasants, the people who actually worked in the earth, were as important as the earth itself. And this picture is very typical. It's sort of divided into three. You can see the fir in the, on the, fir the right in the front, you can see the rather rough uh, grass, on, uh, which is, which is not, not tended. And you see the path going down to the middle, and there's a gate there. And then you try to find the path on the other side, and it suddenly kind of disappears in the background. And you've got the sense of the that middle part, which is a, which is a field which is full of wheat, and then the poplars in the back, and then the sun. But what is very interesting on the left, the trees in the middle one. You see, again, we can we have to thank Camilla because these are the details. Look how interesting you can actually see the people. When I meet, when you understand what I mean when I say the people are always working within the landscape. Because here you see the, the farmers with the, 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 the cart oh, with the hay onto it and, and so on. And the one on the right, the reason I we put the one on the right is very important because fascinatingly, for the very, very first time, we see Pissarro using a palette knife. Can you see this piece here, this, this, this particular stri stroke there? And he's using a palette knife as, to, as well as as well as a, a brush. Look at the way the the kind of the very the, you could really get the sense of the earth with the with the sort of the, the rather rough grass on the top of it. And here you get this whole sense here. And this is what we see here. It's a very important picture. This one it, it really does describe what you're going to see with him doing for the rest of his life, really. He really understands the land. Okay, next one. Now, what happens? In 1872, he, he knows Suzanne. They all know Suzanne because Suzanne was part of that Academy Suisse that I told you before. And they'd all be, Suzanne, before this, had been tremendously influenced by, by Courbet. And he, he, he painted in a very dark, very rough manner. And he, at this point, was living with his wife and child uh, in Auvers saint -Ours. Now, this is interesting, because if you remember when we talked last week, when we were talking about uh, 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 Van Gogh, this is, the, this is the place that Van Gogh went to at the end of his life. And what we're looking at now we're looking at the same doctor, Dr. Gachet's house. We're looking at Suzanne's painting of Dr. Gachet's house in 1872. And this one, the influence of Courbet is very, very 
but very clear. It's rather sort of aggressive painting. It's very dark. There's the house and the road that comes in here. They're both that Dr. Gachet's house from a different point of view. Now, why this is particularly interesting for us, because we were talking about it last week, is that when poor uh, Van Gogh comes out of hospital, uh, his brother, Theo, gets in touch with, um, with Pissarro and asks Pissarro if he would take his brother uh, into his house. And Pissarro's wife said, well, it, he, he really couldn't because he had little children and she was worried about the fact that he, that he of course, was, had come from, a, from an asylum. So they suggested Dr. Gachet because Dr. Gachet, this homeopathic, uh, doctor was their friend and it was about four or five miles from 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 where they lived and this is uh, this is Albert so we're now looking at the same Dr. Gachet and this is the reason that um, that, that uh, Van Gogh eventually ended up there okay next one now this is very interesting these two are very interesting we've certainly seen what Suzanne was painting like in 1872 and he came to stay, which I say was very close to Pontoise, where, where um, uh, Pizarro was living. And he came to work with Pizarro. Now, we know all about this because there's, in these letters, I'm going to just quote, I, 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 think, I think I am, if I can find it, I might manage to put it somewhere else. Forget it, I was going to quote, quote a letter, but I can't. The printer. Is it? Oh, it's here it is. Sorry, I've, we found it. Now, this is this is a quotation. S Cezanne lived in Auvergne, and he used to walk three kilom kilometers to come. This is the letter of, of Lucien, the son, kilometers to come and work with, it, with, with my father. He was about 17 at the time. They discussed theories endlessly, and one day brought palette knives to paint with. Several pictures remain of the work they did at this time. They're very similar in treatment, and the motives are often the same. One morning, father was painting in a field, and Suzanne was sitting on the grass watching him. A peasant came along and said to father, your workman over there isn't putting up much effort. The final anecdote is good. And uh, 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 really, he's, he, the, the, the point is, they discuss theories e e endlessly. And what you're actually seeing is the painting that he was, I think he was describing. It's, it's a place called Louvisiennes, which is not far. And the Pissarro was painted Louvisiennes in 1871. Now, his color was, was lighter than the ones we've seen before. And what we see on the right is Suzanne's copy of it. Piece by piece, it's exactly the same. Now look at the difference between these two pictures. Can you see the difference, for example? Look at the, the trees on the left. This is, this is a copy of this. This was painted in 1873, and this was Louvisian in 1871. And look at the trees. Look at the heavy, very heavy quality of the, of the paint. In, in Suzanne. And the fact that the people, the, the, it, it's much flatter. There's no sense of space. You see the, 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 the houses in the background here, look completely up in the front here. Where well, look here, you do see the house in the distance. You really get the sense of distance here and not so much in it. But it's terribly interesting to see Suzanne. Suzanne actually in, eventually, after the death of Pizarro, when Suzanne by then it had a reputation and in, in, a, in, a, in a magazine uh, promoting his work, he called himself the pupil of, of, of Pissarro. Okay, next one. And here is that wonderful portrait that the Pissarro did of Suzanne. There he is. Look at the background, it's terribly interesting. Directly behind him is one of one of one of uh, uh, Bizarro's own pictures, but most importantly, there is a sort of almost caricature of Corbet pointing down to Suzanne. 
making the re reference that Suzanne, of course, was owing to Corbet. And on the left there, it's a magazine, actually, um, an, an anarchist magazine called The Eclipse, of which there is, he's just put it on the wall. And so, in effect, he's talking about his own social interest, not, not, not Suzanne's. And there's Suzanne, and Suzanne's influence and his own painting. So, you've got that terribly interesting. So, and on the left, you've got that really lovely painting. Now, this particular one is quite funny because it actually is called the Cabbage Field. And the reason I've shown it is because later on, poor old Pizarro was always criticized by doing vulgar pictures, they said, vulgar pictures of ugly people, nasty, ugly people, and, and all very boring landscapes. And he called himself, they called him the cabbage painter. And this particular one is a cabbage field. And it's terribly interesting when you look at it carefully. Again, you can just about, you don't see them at first, but eventually you realize the cabbage is in front. And remember the cabbage was obviously planted by the, by the peasants. And you see the man here, but you don't hardly see this figure here of another peasant. And when you look at it carefully, you realize that you're looking at a hill behind. And right at the back there, you can see integrated the houses at the back here and here. And look at this tiny, thin, un tree at the front here, which completely describes the field and the, the other tree behind it. And you get this wonderful sense. It's probably early morning. And the light is coming very, very carefully, can you see, from this way. It's coming up here, 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 and lighting this in this particular way. And this gorgeous sense of the man being totally integrated with the landscape. And this is, this is, his, this is his genius. Okay, next one. Now, back to Suzanne. Suzanne now completely changed his color. And the famous one, as you all know, I mean, this is the famous Suzanne. The particular picture on the right, of course, is the house of the hanged man. It was actually painted in all there. Working, of course, with with uh, uh, with, with, with Bissara at the time, and that's uh, the one in the old there. And the left one, back again. We're back to Doctor Gachet's house, but look at the difference in the color. Looks what look what's happened. This is 1873, and the ones we were looking at before were 1871, 72. And you see what's happened. The color has lightened, and the paint quality is much thicker. Okay, next one. He, they stay together for about, he stays with, with, with Bissara for about six, eight or nine months, nearly a year, really. Now, these two pictures are important for another reason. They were both owned by Degas. Now, these are the very, in a sense, almost the most ordinary. On the left here, it's called haymaking. Now, if you look at it carefully, you see, presumably a woman with the two people, and here, the beginning of a haystack. And again, in the middle distance, more people, and the, 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 the way that the, 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 the field is, is, is um, separated, but completely unpicturesque. And the, what could be more unpicturesque than this one? This is the plowed field near Osney. These are 1870, 72, 73. This is 73. And again, what we see here, but more cabbages. This is the funny thing. And the two people here. And that extraordinary plowed, almost red field here. And there's a real sense of being, or you could almost sort of feel the mud that you're looking at. Okay, next two. Now, this is just, I couldn't resist these two. On the left, of course, is Pizarro. Now, what does Pizarro do? This is his Pizarro's haystack in Pontoy's 1873. And again, what are you looking at? You're looking at a farmer. You can't really see 
in the in actually in the in the cart you can't really see whether they're male or female but the children played in front of it and this completely comfortable modern work working field and then we see on the right we see the Monet weave strips now this is 73 and this is 1991 now this particular time was when Monet was at, at his most popular he was selling at Duran Royal, who'd already refused to show uh, Pissarro because he wasn't selling. Uh, this particular one was a series of, of the wheat grains. This particular one is the end of summer. He worked on them for a year, from 90 to 91, and he repeated in all times of day. And these are the ones that made the most in, in, incredible amount of money for him. So we've got Monet again and Pissarro. Okay, next one, 20 years before. Again, we've got Monet. We've got Monet and Pissarro. Pissarro on the left, a corner of the Versailles Road at Louvicienne, and that's, 18, that's 1869. And on the right, we've got the Monet Boulevard, Pontoise at Augentoy. He was living with his family at, at Augentoy in 75. The difference, of course, is by the, the, the paint quality is completely different. This is much earlier. This is an earlier one. This is early by about four or five years. And this one is by this time. Monet already is not making, he's not yet popular. He's still being maligned as they all are, but, but eventually he is going to be, you know, he's going to be very successful. Okay, next one. Now, this is a very interesting one. This particular place is in Brittany. Every year, uh, this fat, this friend would, would, the family would go and stay for a month or so in the, this, this rather rich man. But in his, in his he has a sort of a, a, a lot of land. And in his land, there was this farmer. Now, this particular picture is, is, is in the Ashmolean. It's part of the Ashmolean collection, and and it, it, it's farm at Montfaucault in, in the snow, and it's 1874-76. Again, we're very fortunate. We've got this detail, so the colour of this is absolutely right. If you want to talk about it a bit, Camilla, about the broken, because you were very interested in this. Do you oh, yeah, the details that I took were sort of abstracting um, or sort of zoom, zeroing in on, on the, the decay that he shows, because I, I mean, it's, it seems it's a very sort of muted toned scene um, and it seems sort of like idyllic, but then there, there is like, you know, some is it working, the, the, it is, everything is like a, a really working space. Yeah. A sort of, well, an aged decaying space. So the, the roof here, you can see that, bits of it are sort of rotting away, probably possibly falling into the inside of the barn. Um, Lovely figure of the man in the blue mm. with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the hay. And those two little, I suppose, chickens. The sheep, yeah. Or sheep are there, difficult. Those are, those are probably fowl, and then this mm. is- Sheep, this sheep is, there. Yeah. And then there's this extraordinary gate, you see, which is a, greenish color and when you look into it carefully you can see as, as Camilla is saying that the rather poverty stri stricken sense of this farm because here you see these rather old bits of, of, of machinery. machinery of some kind I suppose. Anyway this is this this is what he's painting like in 1874-76. Now this is a really, really marvellous detail. I have to say that the colour of the picture, which came from a book, of course, it's Cote de Boeuf. Uh, it's, the, it's literally the, the, the roofs of the house. We're looking through the, the, these trees. This is, of course, Pissarro. We're looking through the trees into the house. But this is the one, this is the, what I'm so grateful for. This is was taken, of course, by Camilla. And can you just see them here? You see, you can hardly see the people here. And here, this, this is a detail. Now look at this paint quality. 
Look how thick it is. And this is, of course, the right colour. This has made it, this is much too, too, too sort of bright for, for the picture, actually. But you really do get the sense of being in the, in the sort of the gloom, of, almost the gloom of, 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 the, of the trees in the reality. And this, this, this again was in the Ashmolean. Okay, next one. Now this is Cezanne's working with him at the same time. No, sorry, this is what, uh, they, they, no, I said it was 73, it's 77. And this is Cezanne working with him. And this is the, uh, the, the same area, but in, he, he, it's called Saint-Denis. And you get the same houses in the background. Look at the difference. Again, it's much, much flatter. You really get a sense of, 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 of the, the flatness of the canvas. And again, on the right here, we have the real colour, which of course this is um, Camilla's part here. It's interesting again, no sense of people here. And everything, as I say, being kept, you look at the, the way that the paint quality is here and here. It's quite different. If you want to turn the one back just a second, you can see it a bit. Do you see the difference? So these two in the exhibition yeah. are side by side. side by side. So it's interesting to see that yes. the two interpretations of the same, the same scene. Piece. Exactly. It's, it's this particular house here. It's called the Hermitage, and it's one they paint again and again and again. It's a sort of middle class house, which is in this particular village. Okay. Next one. We go back again. It's interesting, isn't it, to see mm. these two together? Now this is it. This is really a very interesting one because. Suzanne's left the area and he's gone back home. Now, back home, of course, is in the south, and it's in his, his father's farm, which is uh, Jas Buffon. And this particular picture was painted in Jas Buffon, it was painted in 76, only about only roughly the same time as the ones before. But Pissarro, the flood at Saint Ouen is Pissarro working with reflection. And it's very interesting to compare, compare the way they both describe reflection it, of the water in here and here. This is sort of almost abstract, this particular one. This is the kind of thing that, that is going to make Suzanne the father of modernism, the flatness the almost abstraction of the shape. You're never, again, you're never quite sure which is the back and which is the front. And what is this here? I mean, what are we, what is, where is this in, in space? Whereas in this one, you see, you're still back to a much more sort of traditional, uh, three-dimensional one. You can, re you can read it. But this one, of course, is, the, is going to be firmly the beginning of modernism. I mean, there's no doubt that Suzanne is, I think, possibly, in the, one cannot deny it, Suzanne is the most influential of, of, of the two. Okay, next two. Now, this is a late Suzanne. This is Suzanne coming back to Pontoise in the 80s. And he comes back and does this picture. And again, we, we, we can thank Camilla because you can see here the real color and the detail, but particularly, look at, the, look at the way the paint is actually applied. You see here, look. This is the picture here. It's the Valley of the Ois, and it's 1880. And this, of course, is the real color. But you can see this kind of this stroke, and this is something that's good, that, he, that, he, that he picks up from, from from Pizarro, this particular flat way of painting. They both used, as I say, they many they both started to use uh, the palette knife at this point. Okay, or well, early in this. Okay, next one. Now here are they all of all of them were etching at this point. Um, again, we go back to to Dr. Gachet. Dr. Gachet had a printing press, and Suzanne, when he was living there began with Dr. Gachet to do etching, and eventually Pissarro uh, decided to do it as well. And this particular one, 
This is, this is etching of Paul Cezanne in 1874. It's a beautiful piece of work. You really see the, the, the character of the man. And the one in the middle is Cezanne. This is Cezanne's uh, drawing of, of Guillaume, the other uh, painter friend of theirs. With, and it's, it's, it's called Guillaume with the hanged man. And that's 73. That's, that's in center is, you see that? And the one on the right is the head of a girl, young girl. And this is 73, 74. Now these were all printed on Dr. Gachet's uh, printing press. So they were, painted, they were doing this little affair together. And this is when they're beginning to think about printing. Okay, next year, because it's a way of making money. These I think are terribly interesting because they're so different. Cezanne farmyard at Auvers and Pizarro's the hillside of Pontois. I have to say that I think the strongest, there's no doubt of it, the Cezanne is the stronger. Don't you think? Mm. Do you think? But I think so, there's no doubt of it, those two. Mm. Interesting though. But again, you see, again you have always, never in Cezanne, but always in, in the Bizarro. Bizarro. There's the figure of the man. The, 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 the Cezanne is, is a bit messier in terms of like what you're looking at. But stronger, stronger drawing, don't you think? No. No, you I, don't think so. Mm. No, because I'm not quite, I'm, personally, I'm not keen on like attributing words like stronger or weaker, I suppose. It, it's definitely darker mm. and, and, and more kind of like obscure, but the, the Cezanne kind of like as a viewer allows you further into the landscape. The Pizarro, you mean? Sorry, the, yeah, the Pizarro does allow you yes, kind of like it, to wander yeah, in, yeah, you see yeah. the, the, the hit, you, you yeah, see yeah. a focus point, you're sort of connected to that human in the landscape. It's, it's a bit more open. It's usually much, it, it's a totally different scene. Though, oh yeah, oh yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. But the ones are there, there's, and they're not, they're quite close to each other. Okay, next to. Yeah. Now this, this is some, this is the saddest of all. This was his beloved daughter. She was his second child. Lucien was born first, but Jian was born afterwards. And she had tuberculosis and she died. And these are, he called her Minette, and she was obviously his favorite child, a, a little girl. And this is Minette seated at the table, a watercolor of 1872. She was born in 65 and she died in 74. So she was about nine when she died. And the one in the center, which I think is absolutely lovely, it's her. Minette inside his studio holding a fan. She looks delicate. And of course, the last one is the last stages of the illness. They cut her hair because she's she's heavy, she's in fever all the time, and she's holding a dog. And that's the last painting. He did her just before she died. Um, and this is 1874. I think they're very touching. He was an enormously uh, fond father. He adored his children. His poor wife was always terribly worried because there was never any money. And the boys, she desperately wanted the boys to do a job that would at least bring some money in. But in the end, they all turned out to be artists and they all died in great poverty. Okay, next one. This is very interesting because this is another group. This is another person whom Cezanne is, uh, uh, Desiree is going to influence. And this is Gauguin. Now Gauguin at this point was a, was a stockbroker and who, who painted for fun on the side. And he got very he got friendly with 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 uh, Pizarro because Pizarro was always eager to, to to show people things. And again, he came to Pontois to, to stay with Pizarro, and Pizarro encouraged him uh, to give up being a stockbroker and being a full time painter, perhaps for, to, for again for financially. Pizarro's got, uh, Pizarro's got no idea of money, and this Gauguin is called Apple Trees. 
and it's 1879. And uh, he, 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 uh, he, he, he was, he, the single figure in it here on the side is unusual for him, but it's possibly influenced by, by, by Pizarro. The one on the left of Pizarro, and it's a corner of the Hermitage Hill, it's the same hill. Pontoise of 1878, but of course in, in, in Pizarro's case you've got the, 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 the houses of the people and actually the people working the landscape of course mm -hmm. as always. Okay next one. The, this I think is absolutely lovely. The, the picture on the left which is very sweet and it's a young country servant and his little his little son his younger son Ludo is in the corner poking around the side here, here. And this beautiful piece, piece of lovely, lovely painting, he sort of played with perspective here tremendously. We're sort of looking down at these people. Now the strange one, which is a surprise for me, I didn't know this picture. This is Gauguin. This is Gauguin very mysteriously being, being sort of uh, a family. This is his daughter. It is, it's, it's called Interior with Aline, and it's 1881. This is 81, 82, this is 81, 2, and this is 81, 82. And he's literally, this domestic scene is very, very unlike him. Eventually, he's going to move away, go back to Paris, and then if it, finally is, he's going to go, as you know, to the South Seas. Okay, next one. The, 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 the relationship does not. I mean, they weren't friends for a long time. Gauguin was a very, very difficult man. Now, this is a very interesting group. Now, because he, this is his relationship with the Garth, you have to remember that all this time, every so often, there would be, there were eight altogether of the Impressionist exhibitions. And right at the beginning, Desire had the idea that they'd, they'd have a sort of magazine to talk about their work and it didn't come to anything but it was called day and night it was going to be called day and night and it was eight, it was started in 1879 <clears throat> but it only lasted to 1889 it was never really published but they did for a time work together because Degas had a printing press now on the left is a really, that beautiful one and this is Mary Cassatt at the Louvre in the Etruscan gallery and that was done by the Gar in 1879. Now we know that one, of course, we've seen it before, but the one in the middle, we did, I didn't know at all. And this is called the little dressing room. This is the Gar, dry point, 1879. And you can see here, the, 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 the ones later on, he's going to develop this scene with the pastels tremendously. But on the right, you've got Pissarro's, the landscape of the Hermitage at Pontoise, and this is soft ground etching. Look at the figure again in the front, working in the, and the really, really delicate, delicate sort of half lovely pale grey of that one. But the, the, it didn't, I mean, as I say, it didn't, unfortunately, didn't last, but it did start, start to, just, uh, uh, um, Great into all, all his life he, he was etching. Okay, next one. We didn't know. Now here are the pictures that they were from, and I thought this was very interesting. Here is a picture that was inspired. It's the villa uh, of Chaponvol at uh, Pontoise of eighteen of eighteen eighty. Sorry, sorry. No, th this is sorry. The view of the Hermitage through the trees of eighteen seventy nine, and the Degas is Mary Cassatt at the Louvre in 1880. And this, of course, is what the painting that, that, that he took the figure from for the etching in both cases. Interesting, isn't it? I think, I think the, the Pizarro, is, Pizarro is very, very beautiful. Mm. Marvellous sense of this, the almost seeing, you don't quite see the houses behind the game, you just about see the figure here, just about. It's always event that, that, the landscape is always occupied. It, people that are working and it, active. Always occupied, always. Marvellous sense, marvellous sense of design of these, of these trees at the top here. It's a beautiful one, this one, I think. Mm. Okay, next one. 
Now these are interesting. These are these are these are much later. This is a later village. You see, you see how his 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 paint, his brush mark has changed. It's Chapelville Pontoise of 1880. And again, again, working in the landscape. This particular one is the potato harvest, and it's 1881. And can you see oh, filling? The, 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 the bags here, the figure up here. Beautiful piece of painting with beautiful the piece of design. As well. Marvelous design. And there's just in the background here, the steeple. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. They're always, always, always. He loves this area. Okay, next one. He, in the 1880s, he decides he wants to do figures. Problem is he could never find anybody to pose for him. This particular one, which he, he went, he took ages to do. We know this by the letters because now what, we're in the period when we look when the letters were in the ages, and this is the pork butcher uh, 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 in, in the market of Pontoise, and the, the figure in front is his wife's niece Nini, and he spent. This was a great difficulty. He took literally nearly a year to pay this. He had great difficulty with the with the figures and he constantly changed them. The, the, the figure of the, of the girl, Nini, originally was a very old woman, but he, he, he changed it towards the end. And on the right, it's women weeding, gathering grass. And again, mourning. It's 1883. And he really very keenly wants, wanting lots of drawings of, of women uh, figures. And he by now um, Lucian is living in <coughs> is living in in, uh, in London. So he we know now these are where the letters come. So we know more or less everything that's going on. Okay, next because they write to each other every day. Now <coughs> astonishingly, I mean I don't know why, but astonishingly at this point, uh, Japanese fans, you know, Japan was literally the fashion at the time, and Japanese fans were all thing. And there was artists were making money by painting fans. Why anybody would want these fans, I was difficult to know, but they were a way of getting money. And of course, he was always short of money. And so this one is the harvesters, and it's actually it's gouache on silk, as they both are. And this is the horse market at St. Martin's Fair, and this is 1883. And uh, again, the, 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 the fashionable thing now was, as I say, the Japanese fans, and they, they, they all, all, actually all of them, De Gaulle, all of them did it. And they, they were beginning, Joanne Ruel by this time was, was their major um, dealer. And he was called, um, by now, He'd, be, he'd, be, he'd, he'd gone to America, and America was beginning to buy the work. Okay, next to not so so much in, in um, the time of 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 um, not not not, not Pissarro. Now we have come to this extraordinary moment. Now we're talking about a man who is well and truly what he must have been about fifty, probably, and his son Lucian. Who, who also decided to be an artist, was in Paris and uh, again working in, in, in the studios and met the group who were going to be the neo-impressionists. And so we suddenly see the beginning of something completely new. Now we are now in roughly 83. Remember that all this time the Impressionist exhibition was going on. The last one was 86. The only artist who always showed every year at the Impressionist exhibition was, was, was Pissarro. And it, the final one, 86, was when the Neo-Impressionists had a room to themselves. And what we're looking at now are this group of people because we're looking at Seniac here. Senior was born in 1863, he died in 1935. So he's a very young man, he's about 20. And that particular one is Place Pierre in the winter. And this is 1883. Why this is interesting is because this is 
This was Sacre Coeur was being built in the background. You can just about see it. Now the picture on the right is much more the sort of thing one associates with Signac, who mostly worked, worked, worked in the south of France. But this particular one is the road, uh, the, this is in the north, this is the road to, to, to uh, Louvisiant, and this is 1883-84. And you're beginning to see the, the, just the beginnings of, of pointillism. Now the one at the end, again, comes from the, uh, from the exhibition, and this was a sort of detail. And this is, this is the port of Pontoise, and this is a sketch of 1888. And you begin to see now the beginning of the dot, because what is going to happen in 86, of course, we all know it's going to be the Sora, uh, the, 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 the Grand Chat. Okay, next one. Now, I've put them up here. One on the left, which we all know, because if it, if we belong, it belongs to the, to the, uh, the National Gallery. And that one is, is actually before, painted before. This is, this is painted in 84. This, I, this was also shown at that time. And that these top one, this one and this one are details of this picture, which incidentally, we also own these details. Because as you know, Shura died very, very young. He was only 30 when he died. And so he didn't do a tremendous amount of work. But the one on the top is terribly important. It's the bather of Asnir, of course you know. Now the others of Pissarro, the young Pissarro, getting tremendously interested because of his son in this idea of the theory, the theory of pointillism, the contrasts and so on. And he, he's practicing in the same way. So these two Interestingly, this one and this one are Pissarro, and this one, the apple trees in the sunlight, and the other one, uh, uh, the, the other one is the country path. And you see that in the dot, you can almost see the dot. He's trying to work it all out. In they're the end, he gets it up. They're slightly larger than a postcard as well. So yes, it's, you can see that on them also being done like in plein air, just mm. like almost like esquisses very mm. quickly. Well, but there, but you, what is so fascinating, you actually see the beginning of his, uh, here you see it's already, he hasn't started, he had, but when you look at this, it's not quite the developed dot. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one. But this one is, this one actually is a view from his window and the Iranian. Now he had for some reason, he was terribly upset. He, I think it was money. He had to leave Pontoise and they moved into Irania, which is not very far away. And this is a place again where Monet came to the rescue because he was renting a place and he, he couldn't continue to rent. And Monet lent him the money to buy it. So this was his, really his first owned building with his family, where he got his really, really rather large family. And this is we're looking actually at the at the um, the barn which he converted into a studio from his window of the house. But this is entirely in 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 his point of his manner. Now he was never doing very well before, and nobody would buy them. It was a very very difficult thing. But he 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 followed Sura all the time in the scientific treatment of color, and he showed in this separate room. The, the, the other, uh, the other, the other um, impressionists were furious with him, hated his work, and would not sell uh, uh, a show in the same place. So they had a separate room for them. And the, the, these, this is what we saw in the last impressionist exhibition. And this is women making a bonfire in 1888 after the end of it. And this is particularly the particular one. There's a beautiful one. It's wash. But this one is oil paint. This was shown in the last exhibition. Okay, next one. This is what's so interesting here, because if you look very carefully, you can actually see the way the, the paint was applied. This is his son, Lucian. This is Lucian Pizarro, and it's the church at Aranje of 86. 
you see on the right, the extraordinary sense of, of the, the, the tiny, tiny dots. Extraordinary colour. It's a lovely painting, this one. Okay, next one. But we've forgotten, of course. They're now up to the point of, of, of Van Gogh. Theo Van Gogh was, the, as you know, he, he was at the gallery in Montmartre, and he came to the, the, the help of Pissarro, and Pissarro was selling his work, he was sharing his work, which Theo Van Gogh was able to sell. As you know, Van Gogh had moved to Paris, and he became friendly with Signac. So he and Signac together, they went outside, just outside Paris, and at Asnier. And this particular one is Van Gogh, in a version of Neo-Impressionism in 87. Isn't it interesting? And again, these are details. So we're looking at the real color and we're looking at the way that the, the, the brush stroke is becoming separated, you see here. Mm -hmm. This is the nearest of Van Gogh. And of course, he, he's going to go back and go, uh, he, he, he of course goes down to the south of It's so masterful in like how he controls it, like the trees yeah. are like actually swaying, but very kind of formulated. They're, it's a lovely painting, actually. So That's one amazing. I, we were very excited to see it. If you can possibly get to the, I must say we, we had the, the tube, which is called the, 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 the bus that goes to the Oxford the tube. Oxford tube is a wonderful bus. And it takes you right into the center of Oxford. And it's so well worth to see this exhibition. Mm, but just avoid the restaurant. <laughs> avoid, the, I've forgotten about the yes, yes. dress. Okay, because it was so traumatic. Avoid the restaurant. Avoid the restaurant. Okay, next one because this is almost the last, the last one that he's going to, uh, that Pissarro is going to paint in the pointless manner. And this is apple picking at the Ranier. And he, he really, what this picture is about is, a, is a very, it took a long, long time to do it because what he was talking about, remember that he's a socialist and he's, he's fascinated by the cooperation of the people and this is what this picture is about it's how the, the the work the farm workers are cooperative this is the underlying idea of this picture and it was it was again it was this particular one by now brussels had had a similar avant-garde exhibition which they called the 20 and all of these people showed in brussels and this was this was shown in Brussels in, in, in 1889. The one on the left, on the right, is a very small picture. It's an interior of a music hall, and it's by Lucien, and it's gouache on silk again. And this is 1888. I think this is fascinating because it's like being in the cinema. If you see with the people, isn't that interesting? You see the, the, uh, what's going on on the stage. The, this is this is Lucy, and they were they were all being they were shown a lot of them. Uh, they were quite successful in 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 Belgium. Okay, next one. Now this is very this is a bit later. This is Signac. This is a scene at, at Herblay, and this is the morning mist, and it's another one the fan ones, and this is eighteen eighty nine, and there's a lovely detail here. Isn't that interesting? Look at the. The brush stroke of the of the uh, the detail isn't that beautiful? I think that's a marvelous marvelous detail, don't you think? That was one of the most gorgeous. Is it gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous picture? Of course, this is the end. Really, they're going to they're going to spend because in the end, the, we know this from the letters, of course, that uh, apart from not being able to sell them at all. Uh, Bizarro was getting very, very distressed. He could, he felt that the, 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 the dots that were too, the contrasts were too strong. He felt that he couldn't, he couldn't really do the subtlety that he had done before. So he gave it up 
Okay. It seemed like he struggled with it because it was did. always very awkward. Yes, yes. He was, I mean, yes. he just didn't ever feel comfortable with the technique, which is understandable. Which, it's just like this so is controlled. Him. This is him. This is him. This is one of the last. It's a beauty, this one. It was, a, again, a design for a fan. It was the last time he did it like this, and he gave it to me. It was a picture he did for Lucien. And again, it's about, it's called the peace stakes, but really again, it's about community, the community of the, of the people, the work, the people working together. It had a very st a strong socialist meaning, this particular picture, and it was for Lucian. Okay, next one, which is fascinating, this particular one. Uh, th this is, this is a girl with the, with actually the sheep this particular one and and, and yeah it's a study certain, in pastel it is a past beautiful pastel this one 1889 this one okay next one there's a detail that's a, a wonderful course. detail now this is the, almost the last picture that he painted before he died uh, this is of course Sura. and this is the the the, the channel at Graveland, and this is this was evening eighteen ninety. But the one on the right is I put it on because it's Senior's picture of Fenelon. Now, Fen all of the critics thought this was absolutely dreadful. They hated it. They were rude about it. It, with the exception of this very interesting man, Fenelon. And this is a portrait, this is Signac's portrait of Fenion in front of the kind of mass of colour that, it, that they, were, they were concerned about holding that lily. And this is a lovely one here. It's, it's against the background of, ry of rhythm, rhythm with, 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 beat, uh, with, uh, with rhythm and designs. This is Fenion's picture. This is Signor's picture. I put it on because he, he was the only critic, really, who was, who was supportive of this idea. Okay, we've come to the end, really, of Pissarro's interest. That beautiful self-portrait, which is 1900. And, and this is the artist's garden at the Ranier. Now, he's still a little bit you see his, his, his brush stroke is still a little bit uh, influenced by his injury. He used the, uh, his, his experience of the dot, but of course it's, it's, it's much stronger now. It's a lovely painting, this one. These are the, at the end of his life, he, he, he went back to, he came back to England for a while. He came twice. He came particularly one in 1892, and then he came again in, 18, I think it was 1896. But these are 1892. That is his picture of uh, of uh, Hyde Park, and he was. This is when he they moved to Bedford Park in Chiswick, Stamford Brook, and this on the right it's the Serpentine, fog effects of the same year. Color has changed. He's got much brighter. Okay, next. Now these are absolutely lovely. Poro, this uh, Poro Lucian was trying to make money, of course, as, as about as unsuccessful as his father. But he was he he he, was, he started the Aranyu Press here, and he was printing, printing in woodcuts, and he printed a, 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 a illustration. He became very much involved with with what, what sort of the arts and crafts movement and uh, with the association with the kind of William Morris stuff. Now the picture on the left is, is uh, him, do, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, Pissarro. He uh, ha actually gets a printing press uh, in Rania for the first time. And he, he he's, he's experiments in making colored etchings, but he now is beginning to have problems with his eye, with his left eye. It, he kept on getting abscesses and he couldn't work 
outside and this was terrible for him. He'd go outside for a little while when the earth, when the wind came, he had to go in because he got near to access. So he was really half the time working with one eye, he had the other bandaged up terribly. Uh, this he, 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 he was very, very enthusiastically trying to help Lucian. So he, he, uh, Lucian was, was deciding to make uh, illustrated books. And this particular one is woman reading grass. Now, uh, Camilla took this, you can tell him about this, really, yeah, because it's, it's all his, remember that it, the, the actual wood cut, the cutting of the wood was done by, by Lucian. Mm -hmm. He was the one who did the drawing and the, and the watercolor. And so he, this is his, his information, wasn't it? Really? Yeah, so there was a series, that, they, they have a series of these um, sort of all lined up in a glass sort of display case. And you see the progression of how the studies and the kind of careful consideration that it, it with just a simple sort of like wood cut. Um, and here he has like sort of notes in the margin and then the testing of all of the, the colors because the colors would eventually sort of be layered. So even with something as simple as like a wood cut, he was really oh, very careful. sort of considered and, and precise. But you know, it was extraordinary. I mean, this colored etching is an extraordinary thing mm. to have done. Okay, next one. Now these are wonderful. Right at the end of his life, he was, he, again, look at what he actually goes to paint. He's at Rouen. Rouen is not very far, and he's hoping to be able to sell these. But again, what is he doing? He's painting people working. It's, it's, this is the bridge at Rouen in rainy weather of 1896. Look at the detail of it. It is an extraordinary piece of work. But can you see the business? Now on the other side of the road, of the, of the bridge is where the where the train comes in, and the business of the of the of the people moving across the bridge, and the lovely smoke in the front, and this again is in Rouen on the right, and this is this is a, a this is particular one is is a, a, the, the the market at the, the the Rue Epicure in Rouen in 1898 on a sunny day. And you see in the background the lovely, lovely uh, 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 cathedral and the business of the people. It's always people. Okay, next to. Now, this is interesting. The one on the left is interesting. We're going back. We're going back to the first exhibition, Impressionist exhibition. And this is the, Mo the Monet picture painted from looking out of the window of Nadar's studio and it's the boulevard capuchin and this was 1863 73 and that is monet on the left and on the right it's pissarro pissarro now cannot work outside so he has to work he takes a room in a hotel and he paints in the hotel and this is what he's doing here this is paris the rue saint honore and the effects of rain in the afternoon in 1897. But just look at the detail of all the, the buses, the people, the, cab, the, 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 the business, the, 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 the extraordinary sense of, of the business of the city. These are very beautiful, these. Okay, next two. We've got two. These are our two. And they are lovely. These are, this is the Boulevard Montmartre. And it's Morning Mist, 1897, and Boulevard Montmartre at night, also 1897. And these are the, the, perhaps the most extraordinary sense of the, of the excitement of Paris, because Paris was really kind of the artistic center of the world at this point. And he gets this, this sense of the excitement of being there on the right. Okay, the last one, the next one, is one of his last beautiful ones. This is Tuileries Gardens in the rain, and this is 1899. This is also in, in, in Oxford. They're an extraordinary co collection, but look at this picture, look at the composition. It's so interesting, in the sense of the mist, 
in the backgrounds that occur. Beautiful one. And the last one, next one, it's his last self-portrait. And on the right, again, we have to thank Camilla for the detail, because that's what it really looked like. Look at the expression in the eyes. He was without doubt one of the most generous, sweet-natured, extraordinary, determined man, and a great innovator. And sadly, you know, he was right, right to the end of his life, he hardly, he hardly made any money. And his innovation has never really been exacerbated, becoming now. I've been reading some very interesting articles. There's a marvelous article by T.J. Clark, which I was quoting to begin with. And he, he, if, you, if, you, if you look on the, on the television, look up T.J. Clark and look up see, and listen to him talking about Pissarro and you will be absolutely excited by it. It's a beautiful job. But I think, I think personally, I came my way. I, when I wanted to, when I first started to do it, I wasn't very interested. I got more and more and more interested. The more I got, what an extraordinary figure he was. He was such an innovator. And as I say, the children, his, his, his son married a, 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 a Jewish lady and she was wonderful. She kept him together. They had one child and they gave all the, the remains when, when, when Lucian died. Of course, everything he'd had came to, 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 to Pizarro. And she, they gave it all to the Ashmolean. It's very exciting. They've got the best collection really in the world. Okay, thank you, Liz.